if you're sitting. It's an illusion, I know it is. But I'm pleased to say that I'm enclosed by spacious white walls, giving one the impression of a vast, open space. It isn't in the least profligate, Dr. Helm. I'm very grateful. Good. This is good. Now then, Professor, perhaps you could relate to me the circumstances surrounding your present predicament. Are you familiar with the hypnagogic state, Dr. Helm? Sam Vogt. Please elaborate. I like to refer to it as the plane between consciousness and unconsciousness, a space in which one is neither fully awake nor fully asleep, a transitional state, if you will. After years dedicated to the study of sleep disorders, apnea, paralysis, and so forth, I began to see evidence in my investigations to suggest that such disorders were largely influenced by one's passage through the hypnagogic state. That is to say, that in certain studies, I observed that some individuals tended to linger longer than others in the transitional space. What was the reason for this, I pondered. Unable to identify the cause of this unusual tendency, I decided that I myself was likely the only guinea pig capable of providing the answers I sought. And so, last winter, I began a series of experiments with a singular objective, to achieve conscious awareness of, and therefore, obtain boundless access to, the hypnagogic state. Yes, yes, I realize the contradiction in terms but this was an experiment beyond mere words, Doctor. I went through a number of phases in pursuit of my goal. The first was the drug phase, in which I experimented with a number of psychoactive agents, the usual suspects, LSD, DMT, you name it, and found that the mind-altering nature of the drugs in question only served to impede my attempts to access the required state. The second phase was one of meditation, spiritual, mantra, transcendental, all of which, just like the previous phase, proved ineffective. The third phase, obvious and overlooked in the first instance, was a bit of the old sleep deprivation. I found that, in depriving myself of sleep for extended periods of time, I could, in small measures, alter my perception of the environment. To give you an example, at home, in the library, I could single out a book on the shelves and focus on it acutely until it changed colour or disappeared entirely. Leather-bound tomes turned yellow before my eyes. Dusty paperbacks vanished into thin air. A terribly unhealthy way to attain a goal, but I felt it was worth it. But was I, in fact, attaining a goal? Were these illusions actually the product of me having attained boundless access to the hypnagogic state? Or were they merely the result of my body and mind crying out for help? Regardless, I continued with my experiment. I slept two to three hours a night, forced myself out of bed in the early hours, and paced about my library in a continual effort to stay awake. The strangeness began in early spring of this year. My commitment to the experiment had lapsed on a number of occasions. Duty called at the lab, and one needs an income if one is to continue to live and prosper. My colleagues and I were studying the unusual case of a small boy, an insomniac who, much to his mother's chagrin, slept only a couple of hours a night, spending most of his waking hours staring at pictures on the walls. I immediately felt a kinship with this boy. David was his name, seven years old. Just as I had been able to do, David claimed that he had the ability, when he was, as he put it, very, very tired, to change things. And by this, he was referring specifically to the paintings hanging on the walls of his home. If he looked long enough at a portrait, he said, he could talk with its subject. If it were a landscape, he continued, he'd send the clouds in and make it rain. This doctor was all very fascinating to me. Formerly, I'd have said that the boy was hallucinating, 